Joining me to talk about British produce is the celebrity chef Raymond Blanc, who has a particular passion for British apples and pears. So much so that I think Raymond has created his own apple orchard and has tasted 150 varieties of apples, who knew there were that many, and even written a book about it. Thank you uh, for joining us, Raymond. Uh, the, the UK apparently has a huge apple harvest. I didn't know this, but something like 1.6 billion apples and pears, is that right? That is absolutely correct. And every year, and that is wonderful news, okay, for the country, for the farming community, for the local values, every year there's one million trees being, uh, being planted in Great Britain, and that is really exciting. Because when I came in Great Britain, I saw orchards being completely dying. There were cemeteries of orchards. Every every fruit was unpicked because subsidies was given to different different uh, form of agriculture. So suddenly orchards were lost to Great Britain. And uh, now there's a river. There's an extraordinary, um, uh, brilliant. <coughs> sorry, <coughs> brilliant farmers growers who truly. Uh, br are bringing in some new method of growing, new varieties, uh, all the new system as well by which those apples and pears are being grown are very uh, care for the sustainability, care for the environment, uh, are very much you know, are care for biodiversity. There's very little chemicals being used as well, which is very important. Little insecticide, pesticide, fungicides, it's really, they use predators, insects, you know, to really to ensure that the orchards are healthy. I think those apples are absolutely magnificent. And I'm a, a Frenchman. Okay, so that was very it's interesting exciting. what you said about the subsidies that were being given that were actually resulting in orchards disappearing from the English and British countryside. Uh, I guess that those were EU subsidies, were they? Correct. And what, Absolutely, yes. why was it that the system changed? Was that as a result of campaigning by people like you or uh, what happened to improve the situation? Um, I think first with his Brexit, which happened, that's a big one. Okay, so that's the biggest take change. that as a plus okay. for Brexit then. That's a good thing for th that happened. Well, it certainly benefits uh, local growing. It benefits local. And we've got to understand when you buy local, you support your farmer, you support your village, which will keep its post office, which will keep its little pub. You will support, you don't buy food from billions of miles away, so you don't import food from very, very far away, so you don't create pollution, you don't have to clean up the pollution. And of course, the best part of it, when you have, when you buy seasonally, okay, you buy locally, you have a glut, a glut of apple or a glut of strawberries, but since we talk about uh, apples, there's a glut of apples and the price is less, not more. But mostly you don't have to import these apples. They are grown here. They're fresh. They are on your shelves. Okay, and I've never understood why the great British public is buying so much of imported food when so much could be grown in Great Britain. Right, yeah, I mean, that is a really good point. Um, so is it the case that we are importing a load of apples when we have so many ourselves? I mean, you don't, as a shopper, when you look at the apples in the supermarket aisle, it's not always very clear where they come from. Very much so, yes. Uh, Great Britain now has got some absolutely, totally excellent apples, which can rival with the very best. Uh, and, and to know that it comes from Norfolk or Kent or Anglia or from, 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 from Great Britain, it's wonderful knowledge. And I think as a consumer, uh, the consumer today is much more knowledgeable, much more aware, and also much more responsible. That means I think now the consumer today um, wants to know where his food comes from, what's in it, how much chemicals are being used. And I think British apples really and, and orchards and pears basically are doing extraordinary efforts and, you, and use new technologies. And very soon we will be able to have apples, British apples and pears all year round because there's new technologies which can keep those pears and apples in the perfect condition so they last all year round. So imagine instead of 
importing billions of tons, okay, of produce and that, that goes beyond apples. There's so many produce we could grow in Great Britain very, very well that we, which are still imported today. Yes. So I think uh, that has got so many values because food connects with what agriculture we will have tomorrow, what health of the nation will be tomorrow. We've got to understand we've got a 67 billion pound problem of ill health. So as you say, one apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, that, I think the apple a day food. keeps the doctor away. I've got my apple here, you know, I'm enjoying it. Oh, oh brilliant. Well, I think okay. the, the apple a day could be useful to keep the doctor away in this country because we don't have any doctors anyway. So uh, I would say that would be a good recipe. But do you think it's easy enough for consumers to see where the produce is coming from? Do you think there perhaps should be a British labelling scheme that's more prominent on our produce? Well, there is, but in, not in all products, and it's not visible. It has got to be visible, and the consumer wants to know because it's such an important aspect, okay, of where your food comes from. Because, obviously, when we talk about food being produced, uh, I don't want to name countries, but why not? South Africa, New Zealand, America. We're talking about here a, a, a heavy use of chemicals to start with, Okay, to treat those apples, to make sure they are per perfectly, absolutely perfect. And then, then obviously, they are, in, they, are, they, are, they are imported in England, okay, and we could actually grow them. That's a whole yes. part. It's homegrown, yes. and that's the biggest message. And we need to know, and the supermarkets need to be much clearer, okay, in, in the way it shows it to its consumer. I think I would definitely agree with that one. Now, we saw some pictures earlier of the fruit picking process, and I'm sure you'll be aware of the controversy uh, surrounding the challenges facing farmers in actually securing enough staff to pick their fruit. Is that something that you're conscious of? You're, you're keen to promote uh, British produce and British apples and pears, but do we have enough people to actually pick them? And if not, why not? Well, uh, there are two issues here. Uh, there's a post-pandemic problem, and of course, Brexit is a is a huge. Uh, we've got to understand we had, I think, three million Europeans which went away from Great Britain, and of course, there was a lot of skills here. There was a lot of available staff and working force here, whether it is from France, Bulgaria, Croatia, etc., etc., and those people don't come anymore. We have lost them, and it is a big issue. And I would definitely ask the government and push, really, to review the visas, okay, the way they are being delivered, because we will need this workforce in so many trades, would be it NHS, whether it is hospitality industry, and I know because I'm in one of them, <laughs> in one of these business, be it Manoir or Brasserie Blanc, okay, and we are short of staff. So even yes. us at the very top end, where, where we are the best trainers, we are still missing, missing you know, uh, uh, staff. So, so definitely, it's a big problem. Of course, farmers, when you suddenly imagine you have only two weeks to pick your fruit. So either you lose your whole harvest or you save it. That's how... That's so you, you, have issues, you say you have issues in your restaurant and recruiting staff. That's not unusual. It seems to be a problem across the board. Um, and yet we've got plenty of unemployed people in the UK who are claiming job seekers allowance. Do you think that the British, uh, particularly young people, think that they're a little bit too, uh, too grand to work in restaurant kitchens? Have they become uh, to develop some kind of sense of superiority over these types of jobs? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, our industry has not been modernized enough. We have not made the necessary steps to be attractive enough so these young people come to us. And it's up to us as an industry somehow to provide the best training, the best welcome, the best caring, the best nurturing, etc., etc., to create an environment really which is extraordinary. And we need to do that. And I know at Le Manoir and Barcelona, we've done that a great deal. We're still not where we want to be, but we see this industry and many other industries have got to change 
So, and that touch, how, how many hours you are doing, you know, the split shift is a big problem still again today, you know, and working on the Sunday, working on the Saturdays, there's a lot of issues that we can, some we can look, look into and solve, some we can't because we need to be open to the public, to the public give our guests the very best welcome. But we so, can do so much okay, in terms of uh, making our workplace one of the best Rewarding with the very best businesses, and that's what we are doing at the moment. And do you think that the industry is generally paying enough? Uh, you know, are, are some of these problems stemming from the fact that uh, those that own and run restaurants have been trying to get away with paying minimum wage for jobs that, as you say, uh, are not always as attractive as they should be? True. And is that, I think we'll, I would like you to look at two, to look at Europe, which basically works. Average work is about 40 hours a week. And in England, we, st we are a liberal country, and of course it's 48 hours plus. And that is far too much. Not today, in this world today, we need to reinvent our, our, our basically 48 hours plus is too much. Okay, right. So it's up to England really, and the bosses in, in, in England to really review these, these issues. Equally, I would like to go back to the young now. We come from a post-pandemic uh, mega issue, okay, where there was so much ill health, families and lost loved ones and, and friends, okay, and the young are still traumatized. They're extremely mentally, extremely fragile. Okay, so effectively, uh, we give, we need to give even more support to the young than we have ever done. And that is an issue. And um, so working hours is another issue. But I think we can sort that out. We can at long term sort it out. Thank, thank you for those uh, very sensible sounding suggestions. Now, you're French, but you've been living here for a very long time now. Um, Britain's in a bit of a state at the moment. You're not tempted to head off home and leave the mess here behind? I oh, would go for a couple of days in the south of France, for sure, to get the sun, definitely. But I think uh, there are problems in every country at the moment. It's not just England. France has got its own problem. Every country is... Uh, is uh, we are going to, we're going to see a maelstrom of change, be it environment. Environment is going to be the biggest issue. Now big money is going to be invented, huge money is going to be invested in science, to find new solutions, okay, about recycling, about management of waste, management of energy. I think today when you think, for example, that uh, uh, now cars will be recycled, and I know Mercedes has done that just as so, it's huge, uh, interesting. Mercedes has, uh, will recycle 95% of its car. So now we, we treat really uh, the, the, the environment and, and, and we, we treat the environment, businesses now understanding they need to change too. And it's really yes. exciting because it will give us an opportunity to invest large sums of money to make Indeed. really a better world, a better a environment. A lot of changes coming up in those areas. Thank you so much for joining us.